Okay, let's start this morning by going to Psalm 126 to start, and then we'll be flipping through some other chapters. We'll see how far we get. How about that? We'll see how far we get. Psalms 126. I've read this before, but we need to keep it in front of our lives. <sighs> When the Lord turned again, the captivity of Zion, we were like that, we were like them that dream. The Amplified says, we were like those that dream, it seems so unreal. Then was our mouth filled with laughter, and our tongue was singing. Then said they among the heathen, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, whereof we are glad. Let's say that together. The Lord has done great things for us, whereof we are glad. Let's say it again. The Lord has done great things for us, whereof we are glad. Turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. This Bible verse is for all those, or this passage of Scripture is for all those in this house that have decided to stay the course and walk with God. This is for you today. Brother Vernon talked about enduring to the latter rain. Some of you have endured hardness as good soldiers. Good soldiers. And God's going to bless you for it. God's going to bless you with good things in your life. And I want you to expect it. And more importantly, I want you to experience it by the grace of God. It's time for all the good things, the hard decisions, the difficult decisions, the sacrifices. It's time for all that to start bringing forth the harvest in your life. In your life. Because you have so chosen to walk the path of righteousness even when it was difficult. You chose to do it in spite of your feelings. When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream because it seemed so unreal. It's time for you and I to start experiencing the unrealness of the supernatural world that God wants for our lives. The supernatural realm of God's blessing and power will come to those who stay the course. And God wants to, wants to dump it out in your world. That's the will of God for you. It may come in the form of finances, some of it. It may come in the form of family relationships being mended and healed and restored. It may come uh, with a greater anointing and awareness of God's presence in your life. It could come in a lot of different ways and maybe all of the above. But Lord, whatever it is, let it come to this people. Let it come. When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream because it seemed so unreal. Because the Bible says that surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell 
in the house of the Lord. There's some of you, 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 you're faithful. You're in this place Saturday morning, Wednesday night prayer meeting. You're part of the body of Christ. You've chosen the good part which will not be taken away. Okay? The psalmist said, one thing have I desired. One thing. And that will I seek after. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. And behold the beauty in his temple. That's for you. That's for those of you that have endured. That's for those of you that haven't seen the rain in a while. It's time to lift up your heads. It's time to lift up your head. Your redemption, your salvation, your deliverance, your breakthrough draweth nigh. It's at the door. It's at the door. That next, that next knock may very well be the last for that obstacle in your life. Because when God opens the door, just one word, and your problem and your obstacle is annihilated. Because you endured to the saving of your soul. The world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that do doeth the will of God abideth forever. Amen. But I heard a preacher preach out the eyes, my brother Jake. He was preaching a Pentecostal message, somewhere between a Pentecostal and a Baptist. <laughs> but he was preaching against sin and he was preaching against living for the world. And he said, what are you going to do if you're so wrapped up in the world that when it, pa when it passes away, what are you going to do? All the lusts and the gratification... That we, that kind of is our energy source. The world passeth away and the lust thereof. It's going to get old, get wrinkled up and die. All your youthful ambitions. All your dreams of fame and fortune. They're going to dry up and die. And they're going to pass away. But he, are you a he? Are you that he, that she, that doeth the will of God, abideth forever? Amen. He that doeth the will of God, abideth Let's go to Psalm chapter 68. If you have your Bible, open it up. If you have your phones, only the Bible. Put it on airplane mode if you're tempted. If you can't stay in your Bible, turn it off. You don't need those Facebook and Instagram messages in the middle of church. Hello. That text is not that important. My phone was buzzing during worship. You know what I did? I hit off. Amen. We'll need that stuff. Okay. Psalm 68. Listen, y'all. It's good stuff. This is for you now. Let God arise. Let his enemies be scattered. 
How many of you know it's time for God to arise? Amen. It's time for God to wake up out of his resting place. The Bible talks about he hid his face from us for a moment. But in the multitude of his mercies, he came and found us. He came and redeemed us. He came and saved us. Let God arise, let his enemies be scattered. Let them also that hate him flee before him. As smoke is driven away, so drive them away. As wax melteth before the fire, so let the wicked perish at the presence of God. We need this presence of God. We need the presence of the Most High in our lives, in our everyday lives. We need His fear to be upon us. We need to experience His comforting love each and every day that we live because like Darwin was saying, the world kind of beats up on us. And continually, we need that refreshing, that renewing. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood. Amen. That blood of Jesus cleansing you continually each and every day that you live, washing and liberating your mind, your will and your emotions, that liberating force of the Holy Ghost, keeping you and protecting you when the seasons of temptation come upon your life, which they will. Seasons of temptation coming upon your life, trying to drive you and pull you away from God. What in the world was in Daniel? What was in his DNA? That when all that good stuff was set in front of him, why would you walk away from that table? What is in a teenager to walk away from a table like that? I'm wondering. Young people, is Daniel inside of you? I'll tell you what. This world can pack a beautiful, abundant spread. It's amazing. It's amazing. John in the book of Revelation, when he saw the beast, the Bible says he wandered with admiration. It was amazing. It's this world system. It's beautiful. It's good to the eye. It's pleasing to our soul. But there comes a time in our lives where we need to make spiritual decisions that go against our five senses. If it hasn't come to you yet, it's coming. And those difficult spiritual decisions are usually very, they come at points of moments and times of destiny in our life. Not every day, not every year, maybe every five, ten years. We get to that T in the road. And we're forced to make a turn. Forced to. If you can make a decision based upon the principles of God and His Word and His calling for your life and His plan for your life, you'll be safe. You will be safe. And God wants His people safe.
The pre- uh, so let the wicked perish at the presence of God. But let the righteous be glad. I tell you, the presence of God has come to give you fullness of joy. Amen. It's come to lift up your countenance. So that tomorrow you have a fresh hope in your spirit. So that the refreshing rain from heaven is what you long after and crave. More than the king's dainties and his meats. God spread a table before his people in this hour. And he wants us to eat. And he's calling us as a bridegroom. Calls his bride, come with me. Come. And there's those of us that that feel the tugging and the wooing of his spirit. To come into the presence of God. We just talked about. Let the righteous be glad. Because the presence of the Lord is upon us and with us. That could be you in your world. You don't have to. Life doesn't need to be mundane and boring. It doesn't have to be. There's a better life. What was inside? What do you think was inside Ruth? When she chose to part ways with her sister-in-law, or Paul, and follow her mother-in-law to a people and to a place that she had never been. Even after catastrophe struck their world, what was inside Ruth? That she saw, an, an, a, she saw something inside her mother-in-law that she had never seen before, or met, or experienced. We need some Naomi's in this world. We need those people. I don't know what was upon Naomi. Something. But Ruth looked at her, and she said, I will not leave you. Where you go, I will go, and your God will be my God. She had purposed. She had purposed. Naomi, there was nothing about Naomi that was rich, affluent. She went back to Israel. Uh, uh, Ruth was left to glean after the harvesters was the lowest of the low. They were peasants, common people. So why did she leave the wealth and the riches and the blessing of Moab and the gods of her fathers to go father, follow her, follow her mother-in-law into a land that was totally strange? Ruth purposed. She purposed. She didn't know nobody. Sorry about the double negative. But I'm a country boy. She didn't know nobody. Ruth purposed. God sets the solitary in families. You lonely? God. I've seen way too many of people get lonely and drop down their commitments for, for God because they wanted more friends. That, my friends, is sin. I'm going to get Baptist on you a little bit. And it'll lead you down the path of destruction. Never do that. Never. But brother, I need friends. You need God. We need God. That was a difficult decision for me to make when I was 19 years old. 
I don't know what was inside of me when I made that decision. But I knew that what I had tasted. See, you got to taste and see that God's good first. Otherwise, you'll never do it. But when you taste and see that God is good, that his presence is liberating for your life and for your world, you'll make some courageous decisions. It won't be, well, it'll be difficult, but... Why leave this oasis of God's goodness for a bowl of this world's porridge? Ah! Ah! God sets the solitary in families, the lonely. A Bible verse for someone in this place, more than one person. Today, it's your Bible verse. Some of them's young people. You're lonely. And God's got a word for you today. He sets the solitary in families. Abraham went out not knowing whether he went. But he knew he'd heard from God. That's one thing he knew. And he knew the direction. He knew the kind of general idea. God gives usually not too many specific details. Sometimes we like it when he does. But he lets the details, he lets us work out that salvation many times. And it makes us seek his face. It makes us cry out to him. Because if he give us full detail every time, we wouldn't need to seek him. And when we don't seek him, we go off a path. God knows exactly how to do it. He knows what it's going to take. So what was inside of Ruth? Apparently someone had an impact in her world. She ended up in the lineage of David. God sets the solitary in families. What? He does. Loneliness is no fun. But I've experienced enough of the world to figure out you can be in a great big room full of people with all your peers and the people you like being around and be so totally alone. I mean, alone is all get out. And people love you, speak well of you. And it gives a temporary high. And you walk out of that place and you look up at the stars and you say, God, you've got to be more than this. <laughs> and there is. But who is that man and that woman who will choose God when it seems like the wrong thing to do to their five senses? That's me. Yes. That's you. You're going to do this. All right, let's keep on reading Psalm 68 because we might not get very far through that chapter. <laughs> See, when God drops Bible into your spirit when you're seeking His face, it doesn't take a whole lot of notes because it just starts becoming living, breathing. We're just rolling in your spirit. Psalm 68. 
Let the righteous be glad. Let them rejoice before God. Yea, let them exceedingly rejoice. 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 Yea, God. Sing praises to his name. Extol him that rides upon the heavens by his name, Yah. And rejoice before him. Hey, a father of the fatherless, a judge of the widows. Those of you that are widows, widowers, God will judge you. And he will take good care. I'm talking about judge in the good sense. He'll watch over you. Just cry out to him. A judge of the widows is God in his holy habitation. God sets the solitary in families. God places the solitary in families and gives the desolate a home in which to dwell. There is no greater fellowship than the fellowship of like-minded men and women of God and faith. There's a sweetness. There's a comfort that comes from that. That is liberating. Not the kind of fellowship where everyone's staring down each other's life and being tit for tat with each other. Gossiping. I got that. O oh God, when thou went forth with thy people, before thy people, when thou didst march through the wilderness, Selah, the earth shook, the heavens also dropped at the presence of God. Rain! God would need to rain. It's time for the rain. Rain. My soul is thirsty. My soul's in need of the dew of heaven. To be able to experience the refreshing comfort and the confirmation of the, the presence of the awesome, mighty God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. can be in your world. Jesus. The earth shook, the heavens also dropped at the presence of God. Even Sinai itself was moved at the presence of God. That's a big mountain. Couldn't handle it. Power. The anointing of God comes with the presence of God. You hang out around the presence of God, you will become an anointed man and woman of God. It's going to happen. His residue just gets on you. His DNA begins to work in your spirit. Before you tried to do the best you could, by what you knew. But now the presence of God actually brings a grace in your world and starts accomplishing the work of God almost subconsciously and very much supernaturally. And so you, beginning, you begin walking a walk that you would have never walked before on your own strength. You begin to make decisions that before... Your brain would have said, absolutely not. I will never do that. I will never do this. Did you know God's pretty good at changing people's minds? Sometimes we need our minds changed. God, I made a bad decision. Or first he's probably going to say, uh, you made a bad decision. And sometimes it takes months 
I've, I've, I've told the Lord a few times, you know, when you, you make decisions and you're not sure, you try to understand which, is, which way is right, but after a while something's unsettled and something seems wrong about what you did. And I've told the Lord before, I said, Lord, if this is wrong, if what I did wasn't the right decision, it's not the right path you want me, take the desire out of my heart. I don't know a time God hasn't taken me up on that. So you're not sure about the path you're on and you don't know exactly and it kind of feels uncertain. I dare you to take heaven up on it. Yes, sir. I dare you. He'll take you up on it. He'll take that, that desire that caused you to make that wrong turn and, and has gotten you on that path, but take it out of your spirit. Because you're honest and you're broken now. You're starting to see it's not working. It's not working out the way you planned. So because of that, uh, you're smart enough, you're wise enough to see that things are not panning out the way you quite thought they're going to. That's God. It's not the devil putting the questions in your mind. It's God. So let him do it. Yeah. Say, okay, God, if I made a wrong turn, Lord, redirect my steps in your mercy and in your truth and in your righteousness. Lord, if I've caused others to stumble because of the path, Lord, help us all to get back on track. Sinai itself was moved. Moved! The presence of our great awesome God. That awesome God in His presence. When I go, I will send the Comforter unto you. Even the Spirit of Truth. And He shall abide with you forever. It's not my fault the Bible says that. That's for your benefit. Because I can tell you, affliction's going to happen. We went through hell and we went through water, fire and water, the Bible says. But our great God brought us out into a wealthy place. When the Lord turned our captivity, we were like them the dream. Preacher, I didn't know such a world exists. I'm here to tell you it does. I'm not talking a fantastical utopia that you see, you know, on those cartoons. But I'm talking a God thing that is real, that is awesome, that is amazing. He transforms our minds. He transforms our spirits. He gives us new and fresh desires that are from Him. He takes the old ones out of our heart that we battled with and struggled with for so long and by, by, by the power of His presence beginning to work in your bosom, it just annihilates He destroys it. That's the power of the presence and the anointing of God. This is for you. You may be captive to loneliness right now. You're so lonely and you... But that thing's a Goliath. And I'm here to tell you that you're David. And it's time to start slinging the stones. First stone you can sling is God sets the solitary in families. God puts the lonely in families. God, I want to be in that family. I do too. That's where he wants you. God, my family doesn't, I, I can't connect with my family. I can't connect with my friends. 
I just feel like I'm out of place. Well, then this Bible verse is for you. God sets the solitary in families. Loneliness, you will not govern and control my life. God is greater than loneliness. Loneliness causes us to do some stupid stuff. It's usually in search of a relationship. And when your mind and your soul go searching for relationships, it always turns it the wrong road. But there's a relationship that's greater. It's called the God of heaven. Jacob laid himself down on that stone that night. Could have well been the loneliest man on the face of the earth. He's running from everything. He's a fugitive now. He got the birthright, but... <laughs> What good's a birthright going to do if there's no one in your world? Question. Jacob's carnal mind that night, I'm sure, went to bed wrestling with the emotions of loneliness and fear, probably guilt and despair that plagues that kind of a world. But he'd forgotten the main equation in his world. God. And that night, he had a dream. He had a dream of a ladder extending down from God himself all the way from heaven to earth. There's a family coming up and down the ladder. Abraham got, or Jacob got up that next morning. He's never the same. God had showed him that he's greater than loneliness. You're a mother, and you feel so bored with the mundane things, taking care of the family and being at home every day, and his life's just got boring. Keep mothering. God sets the solitary in families. Going out and flinging it is not your answer. Young man, young lady, not your answer. The presence of the God of this universe will bring comfort into your world that no person not your wife, not your husband, not your mama, your daddy. Not the president of the United States could give to your world. The presence of the master of this universe calls all the stars by name. I read a verse in the Bible that says he makes the clouds the dust of his feet. This great, big, and almighty God that we're reading about here in Psalm chapter 68 wants to put His presence into your world. And just knock out all those inner longings, all those hidden fears. He wants them. He wants them. Bring you, bring you into a place of contentment and fulfillment that you didn't know your soul was crying out for because you were trying to navigate life through the compass of your carnal mind. And every time you thought you had it captured, it slipped away again just one more time. And so most people 
spend their lives grasping for things that have no fulfillment. They have no substance. And they slip through their hands like sand through your fingers. It disappears in your palms just like a brick of ice. You experience its presence for a little. And then it disappears. God is not like that. God is a God that brings peace to the storm of your soul. Contentment to the restlessness of your spirit because of His almighty presence and His comforting power coming into your world and liberating all the hidden fears and loneliness. <clears throat> Try God. It's worth it. It'll steal your soul. It's awesome! We haven't even gotten to the good part of this chapter yet. <laughs> Sinai was moved at the presence of God. What time did I get started? 41 minutes. Okay, good. Thank you for that, Bradley. Uh, the presence of the God of the whole earth. I keep making sudden turns and my pages go flip, flip, flip. I guess if they made, make these pages any thicker, these Bibles would be like a big block of wood. So I guess that's why they make them thin. Okay. Verse 9. This is the verse that got me on this chapter. This is the verse. This is for you today. This is why you came to church. Thou, O God, didst send a plentiful rain, whereby thou didst confirm thine inheritance when it was weary. Don't raise your hand. But how many of you is weary today? Apparently, God's aware of it. And apparently... He wants to remedy it. Because he says there's rain coming. I don't see it. Elijah. Three years. How could it rain again? It's been so long. Everything's dried up in our world, Elijah. We've almost forgotten what it's like. But somebody's desperate prayer, somebody's unwavering faith, Somebody's stubborn steadfastness brought that whole nation through into the rain. I get too close and people move their feet back. I don't do it on purpose, but anyway. <laughs> I like getting close to people when I talk. Just to know that you're getting it. It's been so long, Elijah. We don't even know what the rain's like anymore. The rain is coming into your world, into the world of the lonely. Into the world of the weary that are in this house. God will confirm 
His goodness to your life because you've chosen to endure. A preacher, I made a few... Are you still here? Yeah. Yes. So don't give me your excuses and get God to run away from you. <laughs> You're here. Yes. If you'd have been rebellious, you'd have quit coming and listen to this skinny preacher. <laughs> <laughs> but even though you may not like me, you came anyway. So shut your mouth and receive the rain. Thou, O God, did send a plentiful rain. That's an abundance. We know what rain's like here recently. We've had more than enough. We're even kind of grumbling about it. Too much rain. But Israel was dry and parched. And he saw a fist. Cloud the size of a fist. And when Elijah saw that, he said, run. You're fixing to get dumped on Israel. The prophets of Baal have had their season. And they haven't been able to bring the rain. It's time we surrender to the God of heaven. He's the one that's got the fire. He's the one that got the rain, and we need both of them. Lord, consume our sacrifice. Bring the rain. And God answered from heaven. He heard his people. And the drought broke. And God was recognized in Israel once again. Thou, O God, did send a plentiful rain, whereby thou didst confirm thy inheritance. When it was weary, thy congregation has dwelt therein. What's he talking about? He's talking about the presence of God in the rain. The presence and the anointing of God brings food with it. It brings water. Everything you need is there. God proved it to Israel. He proved it. I would have Israel know that man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God shall man live. Tried him the whole time. Just to bring him to that fact of reality in God's world that is so often missed in ours. Food! Peter, feed my sheep. You love me? Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, thou knowest. Feed the sheep. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, thou knowest. Feed my sheep, Peter. Somebody in your world's hungry. Somebody in your world is a Ruth. Somebody's going to be Naomi to some kind of Ruth in this world. And walk away from their world and walk into yours. Tell him. Thy congregation has dwelt therein. For thou, O God... Hast prepared of thy goodness for the poor. 
The Lord gave the word and great was the company of those that published it. The presence comes. The rain comes. God's people start living in it. And then the word, publishing the word, spreading the gospel, spreading the good news. The anointing of God is on these people. Because God's presence came. Kings of armies did flee apace, and she that tarried at home divided the spoil. Though you have lain among the pots, or the stalls, the cattle stalls, yet you shall be as the wings of a dove covered with silver, and her, and her feathers with yellow gold. Let me skip a few verses. 17, the chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. The Lord is among them. God sets the solitary in families. He gives the lonely contentment. Do you know loneliness is a lie? The bait of Satan to try to get you to make decisions that will bring the curse of God on your life? That's not you. That's right. Drugs, alcohol, sex, all those things people turn to in the middle of loneliness. Abraham looked at his servant and he said, Go get that young man a wife. But make sure you don't compromise doing it. God wants to help us. He wants to take the loneliness and cut off its ugly head. Decapitated. Loneliness leads to depression and anxiety, fears, and emotional struggles. I'm here to tell you it's not for you. And the anointing of God is here to deliver your life today. Today. Jesus, Jesus, la, 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 la. I think we'll close down with that. Because I want to pray for some lonely people in this place today. I have a feeling there's more than one. If you're 10 years old and you're lonely... If you're 13 years old and you're lonely, if you're 16 and you're lonely, if you're 19 and you're lonely, if you're 29 and you're lonely, if you're 35 and you're lonely, if you're 55 and you're lonely, God wants to liberate you today. Let's let him do it. Sydney, can you come up here and play the keyboard?